Hi, this is J111 um, Feature Writing. This time we're going to be talking about basic structure. By basic structure, we will be talking about the building blocks um, to build your feature. Where do you begin um, in writing the feature and the format with which um, to form your stories. So let's proceed. Before you even begin writing your feature, there are certain things that you should keep in mind uh, before starting. So these are a few building blocks. First is the target audience. Um, your feature can never be a catch-all, um, although you would have a big and wide audience for it. But it's always good to be um, writing for a specific audience whether a specific audience can be defined by age, by economic status, by educational level, you should have some idea about who you are targeting when you are writing your feature. And they should be at the back of your mind so that at all times you will be writing for them. Um, also the length of the article. Usually this is something discussed with the editor. How long should the article be? How many pages will be allotted for it? Um, usually, the editors already know how many pages they can allow a particular feature. They already know how many features they will be having in that particular issue. And therefore, they can tell you how long uh, the article should be. Um, it's always better to try to stick to the number of words that are given to you or the, the length of the article that has been told to you. Otherwise, you leave the editor room to cut your story and it may not come out the way you envisioned it to be. Also, how much time do you have in writing this feature? Do you have a day, two days, one week, one month? So it's always good to know um, the time limit so that you could also manage your expectations. Um, how many sources can you call for this particular issue? Um, how in-depth should you go? Can be determined by the deadline, which is also, again, number four, knowing the deadline with which to submit the article. As in any journalistic task, uh, the deadline is something sacred. It has to be met. Otherwise, we, use, we lose our credibility as writers, um, as professional writers and professional media practitioners. So unlike a news article, which is always written for a mass audience, the feature article, again, is normally targeted. Um, and even when writing for a newspaper, the feature section normally has a target of its own. While it is more mass-based than, let's say, a fashion magazine or an industry magazine, um, those sections also have a slightly different market than the, the market of the front page. As Olivia Butler, a well-known um, science fiction writer, had said, you don't start out writing good stuff. You start out writing crap and thinking it's the good stuff. And then you gradually get better at it. So as in any writing class, I can lecture my head off, but in reality, um, what is important is practice. The more you practice, um, the better writing you will um, develop. Okay, like, so like we said earlier, or in the previous um, video, uh, the fe features do not have any specific writing format. However, it has, it still needs logic, it still needs order. And um, we can easily, we can say that it is somewhere, or the format of feature writing is somewhere in between the news format of an inverted pyramid and the um, climbing climactic format of, lit of literature. Um, so the main difference here or since we're writing in between 
is that you could do how ha you have some suspense but it should not wait um for as long as let's say a an essay or a, or a fiction story would normally have the climax so the climax may not be in the beginning such as a news story but it is quite near the beginning so by the you know by the fourth fifth paragraph your audience should know what your purpose in writing what is the purpose of this feature what is it about which gives us the five main ingredients for a well-written feature so as we said also in the previous video um, features contain the, the what we are familiar with the five w's and h so the who what where when why and how still figure in in a feature article then we have the peg which i'll explain later the angle of course facts because our stories are based on facts and then we add color uh, through quotes descriptions uh, in the writing style, which we will also be discussing later on. So um, it's not a straight cut, straightforward kind of writing. At the same time, um, it's more logical than, let's say, um, an essay or, or a, fiction, a fiction story with its many chapters. So... Um, Yes, so let's look at the five ingredients. First one is our five W's and H. So this has to be well-defined long before you start writing. You should know, first of all, um, all the details, all your facts should be before you, before you even begin. After that, you try to determine, based on these five W's and H, try to determine what your peg is. So the peg, very much like the news peg, is where your story hangs. It is, it is um, in, for a news writer, normally the peg is also the summary of the story um, or the lead. The lead could, could or could not be the peg. In the feature, the lead is not the peg. The peg is found somewhere close to the lead, um, but it's more, it serves to tell your reader why they should keep on reading. What is this feature all about? What is it for? So it, it gives the reason for the article. Why am I writing this article? That's what the peg is, and that's what we hang the story on. Um, it could be the timeliness of the of the story that it, it has to be read because it's happening. It's an issue that is so um, hyped up. Um, it could be um, because it's very heartwarming or significant. So you have to tell your readers this. You have to tell the readers the answer to this question: Why should I read your article? Well, that is the peg. Of a feature story. Example, Misty, the 2018 drama that marked the comeback of lead actress Kim Nam Joo, is a polished Korean gem that has the viewer hanging by a thread, unsure of the real murderer even at the 14th out of 16th episode aired. So this is the peg of um, one story on the K-drama, which can be found, and you can read the entire thing um, in the Vera Files website. The story is entitled Newsroom and Domestic Drama in Misty. Now the angle. The angle is the main slant or focus of the article. It is determines the way in which you will interpret or approach the content. What the readers will find interesting, that could be the angle. What is new or unheard of or unusual? Normally, the angle is chosen based on the type of publication you are targeting. So also, 
when you're writing a feature, you have to know, even if you're, especially if you're a freelancer, you have to know where do I plan to sell this article? Where do I plan to have this article published? So for example, if it's in a fashion magazine, then perhaps one should look for a fashion article. If it's a health magazine, then one should look for a health angle. So it's normally the angle is related very much to the type of audience and what the audience searches for in the publication or platform you are planning to publish your feature in. Now facts. Facts are not fiction, as we said. And articles are based on facts. That is verified information. But at the same time, it's not just simply cut and dried facts. Um, we're looking for facts that will, at the same time, intrigue, entertain, or interest the reader. Um, so more data is always better. Otherwise, we end up with a lot of fluff, meaning empty words, empty adjectives. Um, but in terms of entertaining, it's not just cut and dried by saying it's just facts could be... Um, Facts could include, for example, what the source felt, um, what the source, the perspective of the source, given the issue or, or um, event. So um, it's not just what happened, but what the person felt like during the happening, what they were thinking during the happening. So it, it's a, it's, but it's still, we still call it facts because we can cite the source we can say that this is what the source had said. This is how she, he felt. So get the small details right. So of course, because um, this is still journalism, names are important, the spelling is important, the correct affiliation, post, title, they're all very much needed and important in writing feature art. Now let's look, look at color. So this refers to the need to add description, drama, and detail to the story. Color is not just, an, not just a bunch of adjectives, um, but factual description or imagery. The idea here is that you want to bring your readers closer to the event, to the place. You know, for example, you're doing a travel feature you want them to feel like they were there. But this is just the, this is through the magic of words because we're assuming that the features, that's why it's feature writing, it's all through words. You know, it's not like you have a video um, and you can show them in action what's happening, but you can do the same with words. So the tools here are, the tools that we will discuss for today is description and the use of quotations. So the first thing you have to remember is that in a feature we have to show, we do not tell. So we have to allow the reader to experience the story through action, words, thoughts, senses, and feelings rather than through the author's exposition, summarization, or description. For example, you don't say, George is a tall man. It's better to say, George is six feet and two inches tall. That allows your reader to judge for himself, herself, whether George is a tall man. For example, your reader is a six-footer. Then for him, George is not exactly tall. He's more or less my height. Um, if George, um, if your reader is five feet tall, then of course George is a tall man. So it's better to just say how, what his height is rather than say he's tall, he's short, he's uh, fat or thin. Um, it's better to be more um, accurate in one's description. At the same time, for example, you can't say Susan is a beauty because beauty isn't is in the eye of the beholder. Um, so it's best to just describe her. 
Susan is tall and slim. She has long ebony hair, hazel eyes, and unblemished skin. So if that's our definition of beauty, then we'll probably agree that Susan is a beauty without the author having to make the judgment in this case. So that's what we mean by show, don't tell. Let's look at this example from Vanity Fair um, in this write-up about Donald Trump. It was spring four years ago. Donald and Ivana Trump were seated at opposite ends of their long Sheraton table in Mrs. Majorie Med Merriweather's post's former dining room. They were posed in imperial style as if they were king and queen. They were at the height of their ride and in a, it was plenty glorious. Trump was seen on the news shows offering his services to negotiate with the Russians. There was talk that he might make a run for president. Ivana had so much publicity that she now offered interviewers a press kit of flattering clips. Anything seemed possible. The Trumps had grown to such um, had grown to such a uh, stature in the Golden City of New York. So we see here how this uh, introduction helps put us in the scenario where the author is in. Then using quotes. Quotes is a, the best way to add color to the story because it brings the readers a direct, indirect contact with the source and shows the emotions of the source. So we don't have to spell it out because um, the quote should be able to relay the experience. There are four ways of dealing with quotations. First, as a direct quote. Second, as an indirect quote or paraphrase. Third, as a partial quote. And fourth, as a statement of fact. So first, direct quotes. Direct, when we say direct quotes, the speaker, these, these are the speaker's exact words. That's why we put them in quotation marks. So they're verbatim. They don't add or subtract from what the source had said. Um, now, when do we use this? So first, when the quote can add drama. Um, so it's useless to say um, a quote that just states a fact, as we will discuss later. But rather, a quote that illustrates what, this, what we are trying to tackle in the article, um, to illustrate the feelings of the source. Um, it should be an add-on rather than just stating um, the same things over again. All right? Um, could be, direct quotes can be used also when the speaker says something controversial um, so that the readers know that it's not the author, it's not the writer who's inventing things, but the source really said something to that effect. Um, so we use the direct quote so that the readers know exactly how the source said this controversial phrase, statement, um, revelation. So yes, so we use a direct quote. We also say, we also use a direct quote when the source says something too good to be true, you know, especially if they're making a false claim and you feel that you need to put that in. All right. So you need to, you need, you feel that that should be part of the story because it illustrates your source. So then put that in quotes. Then ideally, if it's something that's easily verifiable, you also put in the correct data after the quote or before the quote but usually after the quote then you can clarify but let's say um, the source said I believe that um, the Philippines um, COVID cases have reached will reach um, 
only 30,000 before the year ends. Then you can add as a verifiable fact that as of August um, or as of September, COVID cases have reached 200 such and such per, um, number. So that it it's very clear that the author or the source is making a false statement. Um, another way of using the red code is to add, when we want to add emphasis um, to a certain aspect of the story. So the quote normally from a source can add drama, can add feeling to what we want to emphasize. So, um, of course, one of the things that we have to make sure is that the quotation is something short, is something that is not verbose. We use a direct quote also when um, what the source is saying is succinct, meaning that it fits in one sentence or at most two sentences and not beating around the bush, all right? So, otherwise, the direct code is just not the most effective, um, you know, something, it's not effective in, in the feature story. We also use a direct quote, let's go back to that, when the source is quoting someone else so that the, the readers can know that it's not you putting words in somebody else's mouth, but the source. So for example, when Harry Roque says that the president says, so basically we're quoting um, the presidential spokesman, quoting the president. So that has to be clear um, in the story. Now, indirect quotes. So um, this is used when the speaker's words are paraphrased, so we don't put them in quotation marks because we um, either summarize everything the speaker or the source is saying um, or make it more understandable. Now, we use indirect quotes when the source is verbose. So when you have a source that keeps, you know, beating around the bush, um, you know, never says a sentence straight uh, or has very, very bad grammar, as in, you know, never completes a sentence. So then it might be better to use an indirect quote. Um, so also as not to embarrass a person unnecessarily. Um, when the source's words are vague, and if you quote them, the readers won't know or won't understand what he's trying to say. So if um, you can make his words clearer, um, then it's better to just paraphrase what he said. Um, again, when the source is quoting someone else, but in a verbose way, then one should clarify that the quote is of someone else, but at the same time, um, quoting the source that you're actually speaking to. Now, the partial quote. The partial quote um, is carried out when, again, you have a source who's very verbose, but what he's saying can be controversial. And therefore, you want the speaker to be able to, or the source to be able to speak directly to your audience. Um, since paraphrasing it would not be the best um, option, what one can do is to paraphrase the, the context of what the speaker is saying, but use a partial quote for the phrase that is controversial or questionable or most colorful, for example, when the, when the source invents a word. You know, when he invents a word which has several meanings, but only he knows what the meanings are, 
and you want the source or the, the audience to realize or to to be able to to see how this guy invents invents words um or maybe it's a witty invention um then then the best thing to do is a partial quote uh, and then an explanation of what what the speaker was trying to say with his invented word um the trouble with partial quotes is the, the source can say you take them out of context. So you have to be very careful in using partial quotes so that um, you cannot be ex uh, accused of taking um, the source's words out of context. So it has to remain in the same context. It has to, res it has to um, maintain the same meaning as um, what is meant by the source. Even if we don't quote the entire sentence. Especially if they say, if they use five sentences to say one idea. then But then within those five sentences, there's this phrase that is so crucial or so controversial. Then, of course, the option here is the partial quote. Um, lastly, the statement of the fact. So this is information given to you by the source, which is known to be true and uncontested. So um, even if it's from the source, but it's, you know, it's something that any bit of research, you will be able to come up with that same fact. Then there's no need for a quotation marks, and there's sometimes no need even for attribution. You know, so for example, when we say um, when we recall UP's role in opposing the dictatorship and martial law every September 21, so there's no need to say that uh, UP had a you know there's no need to say um, or to quote a specific person saying UP had a distinct role in opposing the dictatorship and martial law, and that we commemorated every September 21. So it's, it's a fact, um, and it's said by many people. And therefore, even if your source repeats this, you don't have to say, so-and-so said, you know. Um, all right? So you don't, also, you don't have to say, so-and-so said, Christmas is a time for the family, because all of us would agree. So if, you know, if, if it's something that the majority already agree upon, there's no need to say the source said, all right? Uh, or let's say a particular restaurant which is known for cakes sells cakes. You know, if everybody knows that that restaurant or that cafe has good cakes um, and they advertise for it, then there's really no need to say, to quote a source saying the same thing. So that's what we mean by a statement of fact. All right. You don't quote a source for stating a fact already known by many people. Um, and of course, while we're talking about describing, quoting the source, a feature normally has room for photos or pictures or graphics. Um, when writing a feature article, one should also think, what photo would be the best way of illustrating this feature? If, if you know, you need a visual graphic, there are statistics that can be artistically um, visualized, then go ahead. This is still, you know, the rule that a picture is worth a thousand words still holds, especially for a feature. Um, even if we're doing a personality feature, the photograph of the person that you were interviewing can say a lot about the person more than, um, you know, what else you can describe. So that's always a very good option. Um, so yes. Um, it would be a good practice to already 
see what kind of photos should be included, you know, especially in this day and age where we should be multimedia. You know, we can't just keep on thinking or have the mindset that I'm print, I'm broadcast, I'm online. You know, but already thinking, okay, um, if I was to implement this feature, um, you know, what photos, what graphics should go with it? Um, if this will be translated to an online platform, then I could have my written article together with a broadcast clip, you know, maybe part of the interview on video um, of, for this feature article. So that should be part of one's way of thinking as well um, for a multimedia feature article.